Hello all. Welcome to the NPTEL session of Modern Indian Writing and Translation. Today we will be discussing the play Nagamandala written by Girish Karnad. First, let's look at the structure of the play Nagamandala. Nagamandala is a play written into acts. It has a prologue attached to it. Girish Karnad uses the convention of play within the play in Nagamandala and prologue becomes extremely crucial in giving shape to the play. When you look at uh, the prologue, you can understand that the audience um, see a man who is very desperate to stay awake all night because a mendicant has told him that if he is not awake uh, for the whole night, uh, he will die. So he is trying to find alternatives to um, uh, stay awake and he uh, meets unconventional non-human characters such as flames and a story and he persuades the story to tell him uh, her tale so that he can listen to it and stay awake all night. The man tells the audience that since he is uh, listening to the story and he is compelled to pass on the story to others, the play is put on and uh, the story of Nagamandala is staged. So the prologue becomes the frame story for the play. The idea of frame story is not new to Indian literary tradition. This can be seen in various other works and it dates back to the works such as Hidobadesha, Panchatantra, Ramayana and so on. The Panchatantra is a series of interwoven fables, many of which deploy metaphors or anthropomorphized animals with human virtues and vices. According to its introductory narration, it is composed for the benefit of three ignorant princes and the central Hindu principles of Niti or the wise conduct of life is being imparted to them through these tales. Apart from a short introduction, this Panchatantra story consists of five parts and each part contains a main story called the frame story which in turn contains several stories which is emboxed in it as one character narrates a story to another. You can actually draw a lot of parallels between the narrative style of Panchatantra with that of uh, Nagamandala. In case of Panchatantra, the animals are anthropomorphized, whereas in Nagamandala, it is the flames and the story which is being anthropomorphized. So what exactly is anthropomorphization or what is anthropomorphism? It is the attribution of human traits, emotions or intentions to non-human entities. So um, one may be confused about uh, the difference between anthropomorphism and personification. There is actually only a slight variation from anthropomorphism. Personification is the attribution of human characteristics to abstract concepts. The flames and the story are given feminine attributes, although they are non-human entities in the story. The giggling and the idle chattering of the flames and the personification of the story as a female figure dressed in a very colorful sari, uh, it, it performs the function of attracting the attention of the audience to the play. Girish Karnad is able to bring freshness to the narrative style and he's and and when you and this is kind of a uh, and when you look at the structure of his plays you can understand that he uh, experiments with it a lot um, let's uh, you can see when you when you uh, for instance when you look at the play uh, Hayavadana you can say that again in Hayavadana there is a frame story in Hayavadana it is Bhagavata who is a stage actor um, who is the narrator of the story and he narrates the story of the transposed heads of uh, two friends Devdatta and Kapila. Hayavadana opens with a puja to Lord Ganesha and uh, Bhagavada seeks blessings from the God to uh, help him perform the play 
um, in very good way and he introduces the central characters but there is an interruption that is being created in uh, during this course of time um, a creature comes into the stage and uh, Bhagavada is baffled and uh, he he understands that uh, the creature is half human and half horse and he does not know uh, how to make sense of it and the creature explains himself to Bhagavada saying that he is um, his, his name is Hayavadana and um, uh, he wants to become a full man and he is trying to find solution for it. So Bhagavada asks him to uh, go to the temple of uh, goddess Kali uh, and he, he says that she will have solution for all the problems. So recovering from the interruption Bhagavada returns to the play and the story is unfurled. So when you look at Nagamandala and Hayavadana, you can understand that uh, Bhagavada and the man performs somewhat similar uh, activity because uh, in Nagamandala, it is the character of the man, the playwright who, uh, be, who uh, binds and blends the frame story into the main story. In case of Hayavadana, it is Bhagavada who is a stage actor who performs the same function. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Nagamandala is a story within a story or it is a play within a play and it not just has one story, it has many stories in it. It is a story within a story within a story. On the first level, Nagamandala deals with the frame story which involves the man, the flames and the story which is personified. Um, and on the second level, it talks about the main crux of the play, which is the story of Aparna, the story of Rani and Naga. And you can also witness parallel stories, as uh, parallel story uh, also in this play. The parallel story is that of uh, Kurudava, Kaparna and the Yaksha woman or the woman from the nether, uh, nether world. One can see that the story of Nagamandala, the play Nagamandala is highly meta-theatrical in nature. Meta-theatre describes the aspects of the play that draws attention to its nature as drama or theatre. It includes the direct address of the audience, expression of an awareness of the presence of the audience and an acknowledgement of the fact that the people who are performing are actors. Um, some of the conventions that are being used in, uh, now in uh, meta theatres are play within play, references to acting, theater, references to the, theater, the art of theatre, dramatic writing and spectatorship. When you look at the traditional uh, theatre and that of meta theatre, we understand that in traditional theatre, the, the actors or the playwright wants the audience to empathise with the characters they want the audience to uh, feel that what is, what they're seeing is real and it is um, and they want the audience to feel a connection with what is being staged but on the contrary you can understand that meta theater wants to break this connection they don't want the audience to uh, uh, feel for what is being um, staged they want the audience to understand that it is a play rather than a reality. So meta theatre actually challenges the theatre's claim to be simply realistic. It begins by sharpening our awareness of the unlikeness of life to the dramatic art. It may end by making us aware of the life's uncanny likeness to art or illusion. By calling attention to the strangeness, the artificiality, the illusionariness and arbitrariness, we can say that in short the theatricality of the life we live, it marks those frames and boundaries the conventional dramatic realism would hide. It may also present an action that is so alien, improbable, stylized or absurd that we are forced to acknowledge the estranging F frame that encloses a whole play. Meta theatre also breaks the frame of the fourth wall 
uh, convention, which is um, which is a convention that is being used by the uh, traditional theatre, and they may even reach out to the audience. They may assault them, uh, maybe verbal assault, or uh, so that uh, they can draw attention into the realm of the play. Fourth fall is actually a performative convention in which the invisible imagined wall separates actors from the audience. While the audience can see through this wall, the convention assumes that the actors act as if they cannot. Uh, Meta theatre also dwell on the boundaries between illusion or artifice and reality within a play. The meta theatrical nature of Nagamandala can be seen in the very in the prologue itself. Uh, in the prologue, you can see that there is a man, the play who is a playwright who directly addresses the audience and he explains his plight to them. He also makes the audience aware of the fact that a play is going to be staged. He appeals to the audience to bear with him as it is a matter of life and death for him and, he's left, uh, and he also uh, tells them that he's left with no choice rather than the play uh, being done. The presence of the man, the story on the stage and the flames at a distance is yet another convention used by Meta Theatre. Although the audience will be engrossed with the story, they'll be aware of the fact that uh, um, you have these characters as well. So there is a break um, that is being achieved um, because they understand that what they're watching is not really a reality but a play. So they will develop, uh, they will try to look at the whole thing critically rather than putting themselves um, on the shoes of the uh, actors. This distancing of the audience from emotional involvement in the play through jolting reminders of the artificiality of theatrical performance is known as alienation effect. This was the central idea of the dramatic theory proposed by the German dramatist and director Bertolt Brecht. It aimed to invoke socio-critical audience response from the, uh, uh, from the spectators. The other instances from the that drama that can be picked up to uh, show that uh, Nagamandala is, a met, uh, is highly metatheatrical in nature can be one in Act uh, 1 where uh, Rani before uh, putting the paste that she had uh, prepared out of the roots, uh, before pouring that paste into the curry that she is supposed to uh, serve to uh, Aparna, she asks story, the personified story, whether, uh, whether she has to do it or not. And the story says, uh, do it. Uh, she asks her to uh, go with it. So uh, Rani does that. And um, there is also this instance, uh, there is also the uh, other instance where um, Rani uh, does not know what to do with the, uh, the curry that she just prepared and uh, after pouring the paste uh, of the roots uh, into the curry, the curry has turned blood red and she is very scared by looking at the texture of it so she does not know what to do and it is this personified story which is present on the stage asks her to go and pour it in the ant hill. So um, it is actually the story which is steering the play in the direction that it wants it to go. So if, there, if the story was not really present on stage this can never really take place and we may not be even be able to bring the character of Naga on, uh, on, uh, into the, to this play. So it is the personified story which uh, plays a very pivotal role in steering the drama in the direction that it wants it to be. So that is also a, a, a very meta theatrical in nature. The character of Naga also brings out this idea of illusion versus reality because uh, when you look at Rani, we can understand that she herself is not really um, sure whether, uh, whether this person is real or whether it is, it is her figment of imagination. Uh, 
Meta theatre often explores this avenue of blurring the lines between illusion and reality and it can be seen in this play as well. Another aspect is the presence of the flames in the story as characters and um, and that idea is further cemented when they uh, erupt into dancing and singing in the middle of the play and uh, uh, Naga and Rani also join them. In Act 2, we can see that the personified story narrates what is happening in Rani and Apana's life to the audience and, and towards the end in Act 2, the story gives her version of the tale and she's happy about it. She does not have anything more to say. She ends there. She ends the tale there. The playwright or the man who is listening to the story uh, is highly unhappy with the loose ends and he questions and challenges her. And so the story says that she doesn't have anything more to offer and the playwright comes up with a different ending to the story. So um, the audience expects the play to end there but the flames who are also present on the stage is uh, very much unhappy about this ending as well. So they appeal to the playwright to come up with a different ending. So um, uh, the playwright or the man again comes up with an alternate ending uh, for the story which is uh, happy for everybody. So we can say that there are three endings for this very same play. The first ending is where Rani is raised to the pedestal as that of a goddess and she lives happily ever after with her husband and her child. The second ending is actually uh, uh, involves the character of Naga. He comes to Rani's and Apana's house and he becomes very sad because uh, Rani lives happily with her husband and he does not have any role and he decides to commit suicide and he commits suicide on Rani's long tresses. That is one ending, that is the second ending. And you have another ending as well where Rani allows Naga to stay in her hair, long, in her long hair and live there and he, she allows him to live there happily ever after. So the third ending is a happily ever after ending for all the characters, be it for Rani, be it for Naga and be it for Aparna. All of these three endings um, actually gives the idea that this, story, this play is, it, is, it actually establish the, establishes the fact that this uh, play is highly meta-theatrical. And um, this ending also creates an ambiguity in the play which gives a space of freedom for the playwright himself and also for the readers and the spectators. The way in which the play ends is also highly meta-theatrical in nature. It ends like this. Rani picks up the baby, turns to the man, gives him a thumbs up sign and walks out triumphantly. It is a very unconventional way uh, in which the play is being um, ended and um, Rani's gesture means a lot in different ways. The play Nagamandala also elaborately uses the conventions such as chorus, mass um, and it also brings out seemingly unrelated comic episodes and it also mixes human and non-human worlds. The flames also performs the function of chorus in the play. Um, after looking at the um, the structure of the play let us now uh, let us now try to uh, understand let us now try to find uh, parallels that can be drawn between uh, Nagamandala and the other texts that we have discussed. Um, when you look at the short story The Hunger of Stones by Rabindranath Tagore you can see that that story is also uh, a meta narrative there is a story within a story in that short story as well just like uh, Nagamandala. You can also draw parallels between the female characters of Hunger of Stones with that of Rani from Nagamandala. The solitary caging of Rani by Aparna in the house 
symbolizes the chastity belt of the Middle Ages, uh, the decline of women's talents to a housework and keeping out of women from enlighten my enlightenment and enjoyment. In the short story Hunger of Stones also, one can see the idea of the enclosure of women. If Rani is enclosed within these four walls, the women from the Hunger of Stones are enclosed within the white marble palace. They become the object of lust uh, for Shah Muhammad II and they are also desperate to get out of that place just like how Rani is. Amrita Pratham's stench of kerosene and uh, Karnath's Nagamandala span out the lives of two different female characters who mirrors every woman of Indian society. Uh, when you look at these two female characters, you understand that they do their feminine duties or the womanly duties that they're supposed to do without questioning anybody. They are very obedient and uh, they know what they are supposed to do. They are, uh, they are very submissive to the uh, customs and traditions of um, their, uh, their place, their age. Uh, when you look at uh, Guleri and Manak's relationship, you can understand that their marriage is a very happy one for some time but that happy relationship comes to a closure when Manak is compelled to take a second wife obeying his mother and the customs. Guleri's inability to procreate becomes very crucial in the story and it results in her tragic death. In Nagamandala, Rani does not know whether to be happy about being pregnant but the incident actually heightens the dramatic tension and in the end it is resolved in favour of Rani. When you look at the characters Guleri and Rani, you can understand that both these characters are very childish in nature and it, they also um, uh, gives you uh, an idea, uh, through their characters we, can, we get an idea about the kind of restriction that are being placed, restrictions that are being placed on married women and during those times, uh, they are not allowed to go back to their parents' house whenever they want to go and they both yearn to be with their parents and they look forward to the day when they can go back to their parents' house. The double standards of the society for each gender is very much visible in both these uh, stories, be it in Nagamandala or be it Amrita Pritham's stench of kerosene. In case of Nagamandala, you can understand that nobody questions Appanna uh, for his infidelity, whereas Rani is compelled to go through various tests to prove her chastity to the villagers. In case of Manak and Guleri, it is Guleri who has to bear the brunt of the family for not having a child and she is removed from the family space so easily, uh, leaving her with nothing else to look forward to. Whereas when you look at the character of Manak, we understand that he remarries. He also has the privilege of being a man and he has other modes of distraction and recreation whereas Guleri is left with none. In the play Nagamandala, Girish Garnat does not give any clue to the readers as to where the story is set. The play opens in an inner sanctum of a, a ruined temple. It can be anywhere. His choice of names for the characters is also very interesting to look at as the terms are very neutral and it can be any man and any woman and it can be from um, it can be and they can be from any region of our country. The customs, practices and traditions explicated in the drama is true to most parts of our country. Rani embodies the idea of typical Indian woman and on the whole, this play transgresses regionality and becomes a representative piece of Indian literature and writing. That's all for today's session. Thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you.